I think the one thing we can say with certainty is it's going to look uncertain. It's uh, the level of uncertainty has definitely gone up. In the last two or three years, we've done surveys since the recession. In fact, we've done um, quite a few surveys with global leaders around the world. And one thing they can say with certainty is that it's going to be more uncertain. Um, and I think uncertainty is always there, right? It's, it's, it's how life is. But I think the uncertainty driven by a continual focus on short-term results um, in capital markets and increasing interlinkage between global markets everywhere and therefore the effect of one market um, going down or going up on every other, uh, I think has significant implications on, on that level of uncertainty. So I think that's the one thing I can say for sure. Uh, we've also looked at other trends and, and things that have that are expected to happen in the near future, right? And, and spoke about this yesterday as well. The three um, themes and trends we see, one is changing demographics. So we see how the world is going to age and how the world is going to develop and the shift of economic power to um, emerging markets is, I'd almost imagine, the first big shift that's happening as we speak. I mean, we are in the epicenter of that shift right now. So we can see that shift happening. The second is um, the changing nature of institutions. So we see that collision between the public, private, and social sectors is playing a much bigger role in business, but also in life in general. Right? Um, it's in all spheres. It's how infrastructure is getting built these days. It's how um, corporates are thinking about social responsibility. It's how public sector is in some areas impinging on in other areas um, constructively creating um, the next generation of companies. So it's, it's fascinating to see how those worlds are more integrated and the implication it has on leadership and leaders of tomorrow. The third big trend is um, resources, finite resources, and how we are actually using those resources and in a sense, harnessing them for the future. So part of this is about sustainability and um, ecology, but it's also a part of it around um, how do we be more productive and more efficient in our use of resources? And I think that's it's as much a bottom line question as a sustainability question for companies. So the big trends that impact business are, are these, but underlying all of this is that uncertainty. So at all points of time, leaders need a set of skills. Whether it was 50, 100, 200 years ago, leadership demands a certain set of skills. When I, when I think of the question, what skills are future leaders going to need, I'd imagine there's a subset of those skills that are always in demand, right? Integrity, having courage, um, having the ability to lead people into battle, as it were, to inspire and, and motivate a large group of people. Those are core skills that I'd imagine at any age leaders would need now and in the future. Um, but given that, given that previous set of discussions we had about what's going to affect the world going forward, I think you'd have to add a few more to that, to that inventory of skills. I think the first is an ability to deal with um, and operate in multiple environments. I think that's the critical one. Uh, and multiple environments meaning being able to work in the developed world and the developing world being able to work in the public, private, and social spaces, the, the concept we call the tri-sector athlete, being able to do that effectively um, as a leader. Uh, these are, this is almost, I'd, I'd imagine, the first skill that you need to have. The second, and, and we did this piece of research um, last year where we interviewed several CEOs to ask them what's in their mind. And they mentioned two that I, I'd like to highlight, which I think are very interesting. One was the ability to manage your energy. And this is an interesting one because when you hear CEOs talking about energy, it kind of sounds like a, an out there concept, but it's, it's, it's central to what they do and how they think about life. Because at the end of the day, all you have to manage is your time and your energy. That's all you can manage in your own sphere. And one of the things that um, the latest thinking and research in behavioral economics is showing is this notion of decision fatigue. Because 
the one task that takes up the most energy is making decisions. And in fact, the one task that leaders have to do most of is making decisions. So what you find is if you're not able to manage your energy systematically, your physical energy systematically, you find that you make poor decisions. The other concept in that same space is that willpower is finite. So you don't have infinite willpower to do lots of things. So you add all this up, what you say, what you end up with is if leaders can't manage their own energy, both physical and mental energy, they will end up making suboptimal decisions that are going to affect lots and lots of people, including themselves. So how do you manage that energy? That was one. The second concept, which I thought was an interesting one, um, was this notion that you don't have privacy anymore. The notion of decreasing privacy as a public figure. Um, and this is due to many reasons, but it's a, it's a fact. Right? The fact is that you have increasing social media um, coverage on anything that your organization does, or you as an individual may utter, may think about. Um, it's due to the fact that you have um, more coverage of what your organization does, and that interlinking, those interlinking forces globally means that what you do in a far off remote village could come back to, to haunt you as a leader. Um, and in spite of your best intentions, the chain of command may mean you may never know of these things. Right? So the, the risk for you as a leader has gone up exponentially because of this almost a lack of privacy for you as, as a business leader in this, in this time and in this time um, and space. So I'd argue the three skills I'd add to that long list of leadership skills. I think the first is the ability to operate in multiple environments, the public, private and social, uh, as well as across markets. Um, the ability to manage your own energy your physical energy and your mental energy. And the third one is this, dealing with the lack of privacy, and therefore reconciling to being an increasingly public figure um, and the, the, the good and the bad of that, and managing that. So if we said that these were the kinds of things that leaders need to develop, I think the... The one truism that holds is you, you learn on the field. There is no substitute for that. And uh, the reason that these are challenges is because these are happening right now and our leaders aren't really equipped to deal with those. So I think the first most obvious thing to do is put them in those positions where they actually get the opportunity to try these things out. Right? So you put them in places where they've got to learn how to deal with multiple environments. They've got to learn how to manage their own energy better. You've got to learn how to deal with the lack of privacy and the fact that you're an increasingly public figure uh, in multiple spheres. So that's the first. Um, that's not an obvious one in the sense it ob it's obvious theoretically, but it's not always obvious um, in practical terms. And the reason it's not obvious in practical terms is it's a huge risk. It's always risky to put somebody who's underprepared in a situation they're not prepared to deal with. So how do you l reduce the risk is therefore what you do on the other side. So as an organization, you put your young leaders in those positions early, um, but you also give them the support they need to both manage that situation effectively, but also extract lessons from that. And the challenge, in the, and the real challenge in this is, you don't have leaders in the organization who have dealt with that world before. So it's not like you can say, Mr. CEO, why don't you help person X deal with the situation? Because the CEO themselves might be dealing with that situation and may not be doing such a great job of it. So I think we've got to think a little bit about how the external and internal resources can be brought to bear on a problem like that, number one. Number two, I think um, there's lots of thinking right now in the space of behavioral economics, in the space of um, occupational psychology. And for example, one of the concepts that I'm increasingly getting to see in the in the a work world is this notion of cognitive uh, behavioral therapy and the idea that you do something enough times, it becomes a mental muscle that you've exercised, that it becomes habit, right? So this notion of habituation and how do you develop and form a good habit um, in real time. So it's not about the theory, it's about the practice of the habit is um, I think where a lot of this skill building will, will evolve. So the, the core strategy of that. So 
you want to put people in uncomfortable situations where they are actually going to develop. So you, they want, you want to put them in the position where they're going to develop that skill going forward. You want to provide them the internal and external resources. And you want to do this in a way that's habit forming, that they actually get to do it, not hear about it, but get to do it. Um, for me, the, the simplest way of bringing all of that together is two or three techniques. So one technique is how do you do leadership opportunity matching? So this leadership opportunity matching is, is something that as we as a firm, as McKinsey have, have done before, but the concept is a very simple one in theory, tough in practice, but simple in theory. And the theory is I will find my opportunities where there's the greatest opportunity for impact and I will put my best potential leaders against those. So I'm putting potential supply against potential demand. Um, I match them up and, and being able to find and put that risky bet out there is important. To give you an example, um, one of our clients in, in India wanted to open operations, uh, wanted to set up operations in the Middle East and really expand those operations in the Middle East. So how do you do that? Um, because nobody in the organization had ever been to the Middle East. So it's a great opportunity. It's in five years, it's going to be 20% of the organization. Right now it's at zero. So you have two options. One is you go into that organization and find a leader to lead who is, understands that space and, and, and does a really good job of it. But what they did was the opposite. They said, let's find somebody who has the energy, the aptitude, the ability to go out there and learn on the job. So it's going to take more time. It's riskier. And then we we'll come to the risk mitigation strategy. But just being able to identify that, that leadership opportunity matching is important. What that requires you to do is to be able to identify leaders with skills that you haven't actually seen them demonstrate necessarily. So how do I know this person will succeed in the Middle East? Which means I have to place a bit of a bet on what skills he's showing right now and how those can be adapted in that environment. So that's the part around leadership opportunity matching. But when you send this person there, and that's the second and third strategy combined, what support are you giving him? So in, in this case, are you, do you have a mentor from the Middle East, that market, who's able to guide, advise this person as required? Do you give this person the opportunity to pick his own team, uh, his or her own, or own team as they go there? So you can actually create, send the whole team to that place. So how do you think of the internal strategies you employ for this individual to be successful in that new market, that new opportunity? So that's the second, second part of it. And the third part of it for me is, is a lot of what we do now around simulations, around just-in-time training. So the training bit, which we haven't spoken about in all of these strategies, is that last 5 or 10%, which is on demand. Right? So I need something, I will get something. And the interesting thing about training that I'm finding these days is you can find anything you need. Um, one of my clients, um, in fact, taught me this. He said, look, give me a topic, give me a subject, any subject. And we went through this quite interactively. I said, what about this subject? And we'd go online. In the next hour, we've either found a massively open online course um, from a Stanford or an open university. We have found a really good website that tells us what to do. We have found five experts on the topic. So to learn anything new now is it doesn't take much time to find somebody and do it. It's all available. The real trick now is not access to education. It's about knowing what to do and finding an opportunity to practice it and then get feedback and get better. So that subtle shift in the dynamics of learning, adult learning, is something that we have not seized upon enough. Um, and, and a big, if we are able to fire people's imaginations up, to want to learn something, and we give them the basics of how to find it, go on the net, here are the three sources, I think people would just be learning a lot more than they are right now. I just, that, that, skill of being able to learn by yourself is the core skill that we have to get them to learn. All the other strategies around it, leadership opportunity matching, um, this notion of giving them the external internal support, of giving them that just-in-time training is all there. But once they've got that ability to do that on a periodic basis, then you just see a very different trajectory. So people who are kind of going this way start, each time the question they ask is, what am I learning next? What am I learning next? And they're not waiting for you as an organization to give them the answer. They're just going out there and finding it. And you know what, if you as an organization come in their way, they will just leave and they will go to the next organization, which is what we're seeing in the workplace. Um, and there's a, there's a slightly related point, and we spoke about this in the conference, this notion of Gen Y. And I find this a really fascinating topic because when I talk to some HR heads, they'll tell me that Gen Y is 
the issue with Gen Y is that they are not loyal, that they will leave you easily. They don't really care for the organization. They're incredibly selfish, et cetera, et cetera. And there's another set of uh, HR heads I'd speak to, admittedly in the minority, but they'd say, it's incredible, you can fire them up, they're really excited, um, they're willing to kind of really fight for a cause, etc. How do you reconcile these two completely different views? I mean, are they looking at different people or is it the same person they're looking at differently? And what, what I've observed in my practice as well as, as a firm is that what you see is a, a move from extrinsic motivation to intrinsic motivation. So people want to be, want to be fired up, want to have autonomy want to be developing themselves, want to have a higher purpose. And if the organization is not able to provide for that, they switch off. So I think in earlier generation, you could have people who were in a 0.5 mode. In this generation, you have a zero or a one. They switched on, they're super switched on, they're on fire, they're developing like you wouldn't believe. They're giving it their all. But when they're not switched on, they're switched off. And that's, there's no, there's no middle ground for, for a lot of the more talented employees. So more organizations can find the strategies to get to that one stage where you, you, you have autonomy in figuring out what you want to do, and what you're doing on your job. You're developing mastery and you're developing yourself as an individual and as a professional. And you have a higher sense of purpose and meaning in what you do. And you know how it contributes to society and to your community. I think the, the more excited, motivated they will be as leaders. What strategies you adopt and what tools you adopt are, they aren't, in my mind, that different. Because, for example, if I said a tool is um, the e-learning or the, the university tie-up, right? So you have a good e-learning module library. That's a good tool. But the tool by itself is quite useless. So because I've seen organizations that have had um, great take-up, 60% of their people use those modules. There are organizations where less than 5% use those modules. So the tool itself, and that goes to my earlier belief that the tools are all there now. Earlier it was an issue of access. So you, you could get access if you were a really talented person who went to Harvard or Stanford or whatever. But now you have massively online, uh, open online courses that give you those courses for free. You could sign up and watch the best Stanford professor in action. So it's not that, that uh, let me call this, that excuse of not having access has gone away. Um, now the, the, the idea is how do I link that tool to what I'm doing right now? So I've, in fact, I've got the paradox of choice. I've got a thousand tools. Which are the tools that are really going to make a difference to me? Where do I invest my time is the decision to be made. So that flipping of where's the real access issue is, is, is the important one. And if I can teach people, or if people can learn which tool to use at which point in time, and how do I find those opportunities to apply those tools, that's the trick. So I think it's moved from the tools, to be honest. And that's why I, I find it a bit difficult to answer that question, because I think the tools are all there. 